Hello and welcome to Faith Center. Thank you for joining us today. For more information on Faith Center, visit us online at www.faithcenter.cc. writing he's writing to us to let us know uh he's getting revelation from god and every time that troubles or pressures or this or that came god moved in an even more powerful way amen and that's why paul when he's writing he's writing from prison and he's writing to us all kinds of real cool stuff. But if you go to chapter 1, he'll talk about that he that begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He's writing, and he's also later on, he's writing to them that, hey, do you know what, that you can have the peace of God, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding can keep your hearts, your mind, and your soul. So he's writing these things from prison, letting them know that even if you're busted, even if you're in prison, even if you're in the darkest dungeon, God can break through and give you peace in the middle of it. And that's why when we look at Philippians, you have to think in terms of a guy that's behind four walls. You have to think of a guy that's strapped, got, probably got chains to his ankles, and he's in the deepest, darkest dungeons where you could ever get busted. If you think, you know, Mexico has bad prisons, you haven't seen nothing until you've been to Turkey. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> I've seen the Midnight Train or whatever the heck that movie was. There you go. Before I was saved. <laughs> it's bad. So that's why I want you to, I wanted to preface this, this word that I feel like God has given to us from Philippians 3 to give you the backdrop of where this word of God is coming from. This word of the Lord is coming to us from the very depths of a prison while he's enchained, while he's trapped while there while he's in behind four walls and yet he's gonna he's gonna motivate us he's gonna speak to us to press on to move on to keep reaching for what god has for us and that's why this is so powerful and so now let me begin reading amen 312 okay i have to say all that just to get here not that I have already attained. What does that mean? I haven't arrived. Isn't that right? I haven't grasped everything that God has for How many can relate to that? I haven't got everything. There's been times I felt so blessed. And I felt like, man, I'm, I'm ready to get out of this. Body. If, I, if I die now, oh, man, I'm happy. But I hadn't reached everything yet. So Paul's saying, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. That we can say amen to, right? But I press on. Say that with me. I press on. This is a guy that's in jail, bound up in darkness, in chains. And he's saying, I press on. What are you doing? Astral projection? You know what I mean by that, right? I guess some of the basics is that while you're here, you're, you're just projecting yourself out somewhere else. Remember like the little kid, they got in trouble and they said, hey, go over there in the corner, stay in that corner and you're not going to, you know, and I want you to uh, go in that corner and sit in that corner and stare at the wall. And when they went to look at the kid, the kid had a big old smile and they said, why are you still smiling? Because... I might be sitting down, but I see myself outside playing. <laughs> but Paul, he's going to give us some real concrete things from God's word that really helps us to look beyond where you're at now. To look beyond your mess. 
To look beyond your trouble. To look beyond those things that are pressing in, that are coming to hold you down, that are fighting against you. Everything that is designed, that has been orchestrated against you, that comes from the demonic, satanic. He's saying, wait a minute, I'm going to give you guidance. I'm going to give you clearance. I'm going to give you the word of the Lord that will help you to put you on track no matter what is going on around you and what is happening in your life. Can somebody say amen? You want to give God praise? I'm telling you, that's what he wants to do. So what does he say here? I'm not perfected, but I press on. That I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. This is from the New King James. So I, I, I want to read the whole thing, and then we'll come back to this verse. If I don't come back to this verse, remind me. Amen. Verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended. But one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Look at verse 14, I press toward the goal. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Can you say amen to that? Yes. Now, what verse did I tell you to tell me to remember to go back to? Okay, I'm just checking you. All right, now, press. I press forward. I press. And listen to what he says there in verse 12. And I, I, half, halfway through that verse, after he said he's not perfect, and none of us are perfect. There is only one perfect. And his name is Jesus. But what does he say? I press on. And listen, what is he pressing on to? That I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. I want you to know that the Lord got a hold of you on purpose. The Lord got a hold of you for a reason. Now, I didn't know this back, back in the mid-70s when God was, you know, he was, he was blowing my mind. He really was. I didn't know this, but when God was moving in my life, when, he, when I would get wasted and I would be smoking and toking up and I would be hitting it hard, in the middle of that, God was convicting me. In the middle of my mess, God was convicting me because he was trying to do so. I didn't know he was trying to get a hold of me. What Paul is saying here is he's saying to us that, hey, I press, I'm pressing. Uh, those of you that lift weights, I'm not a weightlifter, as you can tell. But those of you that press, you know, you, you bench press. The more you press, the more you're able to do, the more that you press the more that you're able to take on. There was a guy that we were, uh, I was around uh, maybe about a week ago or something like that, and the guy don't even weigh like 200 pounds, and he was talking about how he was lifting like twice his weight. Boy, if I did that, hey, that'd be good. <laughs> but to press, the idea is that, number one, the first thing I want to tell you is that we need to press to lay hold of whatever it is that God has laid hold of you for. How many know that God got a hold of you on purpose for a reason? And what Paul is saying to us here from the dungeon, here from prison, he's reminding us, saying to us, he's letting us know that you need to keep pressing on to get a hold of whatever it is that he got a hold of you for. So what he's saying is that even while he's in prison, he's realizing, hey, I'm busted. I'm way down here. I'm going to court, and they got me bound up. But I know that God called me to preach the gospel to the Gentile. I know that God has a plan for my life. I know that I'm, I'm not going to stay here forever. I know that I'm going to be out there doing something for the Lord. 
And what does he say there in verse 12? But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Can I tell you that God put his hold on you? He got a hold of you. God got a hold of you. He got a hold of you for a reason. Yeah, he had something in mind. He wants to use you. And he's going to use you. He's going to use all of us. You know, sometimes we think, oh, God only wants to use a pastor. No, God's going to use all of us, every one of us. It's not just the pastor, it's not just the leader, it's not just, it's every one of us. And what he's telling us is, and he's reminding us, hey, keep pressing, keep pressing to get a hold of whatever it is that he got a hold of your life for. And he reminds us that. Go with me to the book of Acts chapter 9. Go with me over there real quick, if you don't mind, praise God. Acts chapter 9, praise the Lord. Acts chapter 9, and I want you to um, go with me just, just briefly because right here we really do get to see why God got a hold of him. Acts chapter 9, you'll, you'll begin to see this. How I many you know that, man, I'll tell you that uh, when you think about Paul, it was a radical, radical conversion. It really was. It was radical. See, I don't know. How did God get a hold of you? Was it a radical thing? For some of us, it, it, for some of us, it was just like little seeds where the Lord... He just, he started with a seed. Somebody says something to you, and it just stuck to you. And it stuck with you, and then you found yourself somewhere, wherever that was, and whatever was happening, whatever the circumstances, and that seed came back to you. And that was, God, that was God's way of working on you. Isn't that right? That was God's way of working on you. And, and it might have started as a seed. Sometimes I tell people, when I decided to follow and serve God, I was at a bar. And sometimes people will trip out because they think you have to be in a big old church with stained glass window. You have to have, you know, a cross and all this stuff. And that's where God moves. I was in a bar. I was literally in a bar. When God was moving upon me, when he was reminding me of all the hurt, the pain, all the turmoil, and all the junk that was happening to me, in the middle of that, he was softening up my heart. He broke my heart in pieces. In the middle of that, he began to say, man, I'm the one that's going to heal you. I'm the one that's going to restore you. I am the one that can mend that broken heart in your life. And that's why, for, for me, I don't know if that's radical or not, but for me, I was, I was having dreams, literally dreams. I had a dream. <laughs> I'm like, I have a dream. But I really, literally, I would have like some crazy stuff. And I wasn't high. Hello, are you here? Because sometimes when I talk about those things, you know, um, I know what it's like for the Lord to show up to my, in my bedroom. Waking up hungover, waking up coming off of this thing. And I know what it's like, and, and having the Spirit of God say, Rudy, Rudy, Rudy. I know what it's like to, to have the Lord saying to me, Rudy, why do you say that you love this person and you're feeding them poison? I know what it's like to, in the middle of. The night as, as I'm having a dream about God to wake up and the, the room is saturated with the presence of God and I can't help but to bawl and cry and break down. For the Apostle Paul, his, his thing was that he was a, a radical, religious individual 
that believed in, in the law of God and wanted to stick to the law and would fight anybody that opposed the law of God. He was committed. He was sold out. He was a scribe of the scribe. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was circumcised also, uh, you know, according to the law. So he was crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's. He was following everything to the T. And that's why he was so offended whenever anybody would come along and they would preach Jesus. He, he, for him, this cannot be the Messiah. And he literally had to get a revelation of the, of the prophets of old speaking and saying, hey, this is him that is coming. He's going to hang on a tree. He, he's going he's gonna to give his life up. He literally had to um, be convinced by the scriptures in his situation. And I want to begin to pick it up in Acts chapter 9. Are you there? Look at Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Then Saul was breathing out threatenings and murder against who? 9-1. The disciples of who? The Lord. He was coming against the disciples of the Lord. So he went to the high priest and asked letters from them of Damascus, of the synagogues of the Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And he journeyed and he came near Damascus. Look at that. He journeyed and he came near Damascus. So that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Isn't that right? He wanted to, he's ready to bust them. He's ready to drag them out of their Bible studies. Drag them out of their prayer meetings. And he's ready to take them. And look at verse 3. And as he journeyed and he came near Damascus, verse 3. I probably missed the verse, but verse 3. Suddenly a light shone around from him from heaven. That's radical. Say that with me. It's radical. A light came to him from heaven. And verse 4. Then he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him. Praise God when the voice, find, when we finally hear the voice, huh? When all of a sudden, man, it speaks loud and clear right in here. And you know that it's God. And you can't fight it. You can't resist it. You know that you know that God has spoken to you. One, uh, I think a week or two ago, I said, hey, find out what God is saying to you. Be sensitive enough to know what he's saying to you. And then give yourself to what he's saying to you. Stick to what he puts in here. Don't be so, you know, oh, they said this, and they said that, and they said this, and they said that. You know what I've done over the years is I know that I know that God spoke to me. I know that I'm saved. I know that I've been born again, and I know that he called me. That's all I know. And sometimes that thing, that call has been crazy. Sometimes it's looked fruitful. Sometimes I feel like, man, what the heck am I doing? Sometimes, man, in the midst of the fire, in the midst of all these things, sometimes you want to quit. Sometimes you want to throw in the towel. Sometimes you feel like the doors are closed. But the reality is just like Paul the Apostle, he was in prison and the, uh, he was all sealed in. But he's still saying, wait a minute, keep pressing on to what God called you to do. And that's, that's the, the number one thing he's saying, whatever he got a hold of me for, that's what I'm pressing for. My number one goal in 2017 is to let God get a hold of me. I want to get a hold of God. I want to get a hold of whatever it is that he got a hold of me for. And so what did he say? This light knocked him down. He heard that voice. Why are you persecuting me? Verse 5, and he said, here we go. Who are you, Lord? Praise God. You ever said that? Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Is it hard for you to kick against the, the goats or the pricks, the sharp edges, that which God is doing in your life? You keep kicking against it. This is God's will. This is God's plan. And you keep kicking against what the Lord is doing. 
But look at verse 6. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Praise God. Have you said that yet? Praise God. You ever been like in a little squabble with your wife or your husband? You say, well, what do you want me to do? <laughs> and sometimes you only said that to get them off your back. <laughs> and the reality is you weren't really thinking of doing what, what you weren't really thinking of whatever you want me to do. Tell they're walking out the door. <laughs> No, I really mean it. What do you want me to do? Isn't that right? Come on, don't look at me like that. But see, the idea is when we say to the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? We're not just saying it to get them off our back. Right? Come on. You know what I mean? We're not saying it. To, okay, Lord. Okay, what do you want me to do? No. Lord, what do you want me to do? I know it's going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. I may find opposition. Things may come against me. But Lord, what do you want me to do? And then look at what the, and then the Lord said to him. Wow, isn't that something that as soon as you ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then, then he tells you. See, don't ask the Lord, what do you want me to do if you don't mean it? Some of us, we're so used to being, you know, we just want to play church. Lord, what do you want me to do? But we're not really, are we serious? Lord, what do you want me to do? Now, the, the thing is that when we say to God, what do you want me to do is that we, we got to, you ever heard that saying that says, put your money where your mouth is? When we say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then, and he says, well, I want you to go over there. But Lord, I don't like over there. Something wrong with those people over there. Man, there's too many freaks over there. There's too much commotion in Goshen, right? There's just too much. Lord, what, you know, and you want me to what? Just do it. Just do it. Remember, we, we already, last week we said obedience is better than sacrifice. To obey is better. So what did he say to him? Look at verse 6. What do you want me to do? And then the Lord said to him, arise, go into the city. That's why I went to San Francisco. Go to the city. <laughs> no, that's not why I went. And you will be told what you must do. You notice what he says, what you must do. See, part of the thing is that a lot of times we don't always want to do, you know what I mean? Well, Lord, it's, it, it, if it sounds good, I'm in. If it involves Disneyland, we're in. <laughs> right? I mean, that's a lot of times we're thinking like, man, if it's a free ride, I'm in. Come on, you ever heard that term? If it's a free ride, I'm in. Uh, you, you, how do they say uh, you fly I buy or something like that well alright okay but look at that verse 6 and I want you to really underline that he says when you go there it's going to be told you what you must do see part of the, I, I think part of our challenge has always been uh, to accept the fact that the Lord is telling us things that we must do because a lot of times it's easier for us to say, well, wait a minute, God is love. He's not going to tell me to do that. Yes, he is. He's telling you to do that because he is love. And he knows best. And so listen to what happens here. And look at verse 7. And the men who journeyed with him, they stood, they stood speechless. See, nobody knows what to say when God speaks. Isn't that right? Let it, all the voices around you that try to distract you and bring you away from what God is saying, may they be speechless. And, not, and may you not be influenced by them trying to detour you 
from what the Lord is saying for you to do. And so what happened? He's saying that um, verse 8, And Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand, and they brought him unto Damascus. Look at verse 9. How many know that this is real serious when, when this happens? And he was there, and he was there three days without sight, neither eating nor drinking. He, he then, he, he's blind, and he's not eating, and he's not drinking. You know, how many know that it's pretty uh, serious when you're not eating? You see, when you're not eating, you're sick. Otherwise, you'd be eating all the time. You know, I'm just saying. But a lot of times, you know, when, when we get serious and we start seeking God, we're willing to not eat. We're willing to not, you know what I mean? That we're willing to separate ourselves. And then we're willing also, like he says, no sight. He said he, he was blind. And, and when we're seeking God, we're willing to go into a fasting, a prayer. And we're willing, man, not to look at everything else but to stay focused on what God is doing and what God is saying to us. And I, I want you to go with me, uh, go with me over to the book of Acts chapter 20, and I'm going to be closing up here. I won't, I won't throw all the things at you today that we need to do, but one of them is the first one that you need to get today is that we're pressing to lay hold of whatever it is that he's got a hold of you for. And maybe next week we're going to talk about the power of forgetting because Paul mentions that we have to forget. Forgetting what's behind you. Because some people, man, are trapped because of their past. And some of us sometimes we're trapped by our successes of the past that we don't move forward. So later on, we're, we're going to, you know, launch into that and, and try to tackle each one of these areas throughout January. So that in January, by the time we're done with January, we go into February having more of a sense that we're moving in what God has for us. Amen? And later on, you're going to find out because he uses that word to press in again. He's, he, use, he's, he uses twice, he's saying, I keep, I press. Twice within that context of scripture, he's saying to us that he keeps pressing. But later on, we'll find out some other things. But go with me to Acts 20, right? And then we're going to close off. Acts 20. Let's see. Acts 20, 22, please. You're too fast for me. No. <laughs> Acts 20, 22, and then we're going to close off. Boy, but I, I really want you to know today that one of the first things we need for 2017 is to press, to, to, to push, to do everything you can to get a hold of whatever it is that God got a hold of you for. I always have to go back. And every time I do, man, I sense the power. I sense the anointing. I feel a sense of destiny. I feel a sense that a divineness, that God was reaching into the darkness, into the pit, and pulling me out and bringing me into the light. The revelation of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the revelation that he's alive, the revelation that his word is for us today. Just that very revelation. I'm telling you that if we could get a hold of that revelation, we can transform the lives of young people that are going through life aimlessly, that are just addicted in drugs, that are confused, that have no direction in their life. If they understand that God wants to get a hold of them for a reason and a purpose, they'll have a sense of destiny. They won't just be... You know, just hanging out, going aimlessly nowhere in life, man. They'll have a sense of destiny, and they'll have direction in their life. 
Light will come. Can you say amen? Did we read that yet? Acts 20, 22. Listen to the, what he says here. This is Paul, the apostle. In Acts 20, and um, look at verse 16. I'm just going to read part of it. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem as possible on the day of Pentecost. See how he's always going somewhere on purpose, Paul the Apostle? In Acts 20, verse 17, from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, and he called for the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said, You know from the first day that I came to Asia, what manner I've lived among you, serving the Lord with all. Listen how he served the Lord. Serving the Lord with all humility. Isn't that right? We got to keep that. Be humble, man. If you're humble, you'll go far. Serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials. I mean, no, you got to be able to press through all that. That's what Paul, is, that's what we're saying, pressing Pressing through the tests and trials, which happened to me by the plotting. That's why you hear me pray certain things. By the plotting of the Jews. And look at verse 20, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and to the Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the spirit. Did you notice that even though there's testing, there's trials and all that stuff, you're still in the spirit. Because sometimes we have that tendency to say, oh, it must not be God. Just because there's testing, trials, there's problems, doesn't mean that God isn't working. And he says, I go bound in the spirit, not knowing the things that will happen to me, except the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that chains and tribulations await me. Would you still move in God if you knew that you were going to be facing chains and tribulations? But look at verse 24, but none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I might finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus and to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Amen. Let's lift our hands to the Lord and praise God. Father, we worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, you're with us, Father. Father, through every testing, every trial, Father God, you're with us now, Father. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, the Lord is my shepherd. In the very midst of all that we face, Father, Jesus is Lord. Father, I pray right now, Father God, that you'll just move, God, that even in the midst of the chains and the trials and when we feel like we're walled in, Father, we'll keep pressing on, Father, to get a hold of that which you laid hold of us for. In the name of Jesus, Father, bless your people this morning. Bring liberty, bring peace, bring freedom. In Jesus' mighty name. Stretch your hands toward the iPad, and you know what? We're just going to ask God to move. But, Father, we just pray for all those that are watching the revelation of Jesus. Father, even through Facebook, in the middle of all that sometimes looks deceiving, sometimes looks like everybody's got a perfect life or whatever, I pray that Jesus will bring light, the life of God, the mercy, the grace of Almighty God. Save, heal, deliver. Bring your blessing upon those that are listening even now, Father. And Lord, in the name of Jesus, let it be a miraculous thing. May we hear testimonies of the power of God 
In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen.